This is Christopher John Bjorkness. It is April 28th, 2022. Uh, I am honored and privileged to be speaking today with Dr. Robert M. Price, one of the premier theologians in our era. And uh, he is extremely generous with his time, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity of speaking with him. Uh, welcome and thank you, Dr. Price. Oh, it's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, Dr. Price is the author of numerous scholarly books, and I'm particularly interested in his uh, wonderful expertise in the historicity of Paul and the authenticity and inauthenticity of the epistles of Paul and subsections of those epistles. And I would like to discuss that with him. Uh, we're going to be talking about Paul's Gnosticism, perhaps Merkava mysticism. We're going to be uh, delving into Marcion, uh, Simon Magus, and uh, who Paul really was, who actually wrote the epistles, and where these stories came from, and what the intent of the author of the legend of Paul was, to the best of our ability to determine based upon facts and logic. So greetings, Dr. Price. Uh, I came across your work first uh, hearing you on Myth Vision and on Adam Green's program, No More News. Uh -huh. And uh, I came across an article you had written where you discussed Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus when he was sent by the high priest to gather up the Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. And you pointed out that uh, it was an apparent, the story was an apparent plagiarism of Euripides' play, the Bacchae, and second Maccabee's story of the conversion of Heliodorus. Do I have that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you like to speak to that? Yeah, it's very uh, striking how many even supposedly critical scholars just blithely read into the epistles uh, accredited to Paul the story of the Damascus Road, uh, which is nowhere mentioned. Uh, well, I mean, certainly his conversion is mentioned, though, right? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, in Now, this is on the assumption that Paul actually wrote these epistles, which is another can of worms, as you pointed out. But even on a traditional reading, the closest he seems to come to this, which isn't all that close, is in uh, Galatians when he says, when it pleased God to reveal his son to me or in me, you could translate it either way equally, uh, I didn't go to Jerusalem immediately, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, what were the circumstances of that revelation? I uh, don't think it says, uh, and and the ambiguity of to me, which would at least allow for the Damascus Road vision, and on the other hand, in me, which may imply a whole different thing, a kind of just a spiritual awakening under any circumstances, uh, that is uh, significant. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 1, he says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? Well, presumably that uh, refers to some sort of resurrection appearance, but it's not all that clear because after all, in 2 Corinthians, he speaks of a, of a trip to the third heaven, where it seems to me it implies that is where he saw the Lord, but who knows? It, but certainly... May I speak to that issue of the third heaven? Yeah, please. Uh, the third heaven in the Pythagorean system would be Jupiter, which would be uh, the morning star and the light bringer, Lucifer. So it's very interesting that that is the heaven that Paul claims to have ascended to. And if I remember correctly, he speaks in the third person, does he not? Yeah, he uh, switches back. Uh, well, he says, I know a man in Christ uh, to whom all this happened, but then very quickly it becomes I. Uh, and uh, it, that's been a real uh, 
bone of contention for a long time because of the same sort of ambiguity. What exactly does he mean? Is he trying to say it was like an out-of-body experience, that the dissociation was so great that it was as if he saw it happening to another? That seems kind of strange to me. I, I'm not really sure what the, the point is. Uh, you, you might wonder if there's been some sort of an interpolation there that uh, that someone or or that someone has uh, made it into a, an experience of Paul that he was actually talking about someone else, and whoever decided to change it was a little careless and didn't change it all the way up. It really is very confusing, but at least as it stands now, he seems to mean himself. Um, I know uh, in uh, Judaism, the third heaven was supposed to be either the highest heaven where God had his throne, or if that was the seventh heaven, the third heaven was supposed to be the paradise of the righteous. Uh, yes, and, there are uh, glosses in the Talmud in uh, Hagigah, I think it's folio 12, which describes the seven heavens, and it places all the planets within one of the heavens. But the uh, Pythagorean system is different in that the seven heavens correlate directly to the seven planets. And the seventh heaven would be the planet Saturn, which um, in Judaism can be viewed as the seat of Yahweh or as the seat of the Godhead. So it, there are two uh, divergent systems. And this whole idea of ascension relates to Merkava and mysticism. Yep. And it also relates to the emanation theories of the Greeks both the religious theories of the Orphic myths, myth, uh, mystics and their mystery religions, and the Platonic idea of the one emanating the Demiurge who emanates the world soul, which then emanates the lesser gods. And uh, those gods create, the Demiurge creates humanity and everything else below the great divide in which the Trinity resides. Mm. So it is quite interesting that Paul is bringing up these connotations of Gnosticism, because Gnosticism is also an emanation theory, which I believe drew heavily from these Greek concepts of the one and the demiurge and the world soul. And another aspect of Merkava mysticism is the guff, which is the well of souls that produces all of these things, just as the world soul does in the Greek system. So, um, we have now addressed the idea that there is some confusion about Paul's conversion, where it came from, and what it actually meant. Do you believe that Paul is an actual historical figure? Was he created by Marcion? Is he a reflection of Simon Magus? What is your uh, present thinking on those issues? Yeah, I still uh, hold to the theory uh, that kind of uh, evolved between uh, one of uh, F.C. Bauer's uh, students at Tübingen, I forget which one, was Schwegler or I forget, uh, but uh, the theory that um, Simon Magus is a kind of a, a, of a sanitized, well, that, that Paul, the Paul character uh, was, um, as Tertullian later called him, the apostle of Marcion and the apostle of the heretics, and that uh, he was actually called uh, both by different people, both Paul and Simon Magus, or Simon, and uh, that he uh, being Marcion was called. No, I'm sorry. Uh, that uh, the character, whoever we want to call him, was was alternately Simon uh, and or uh, Paul, depending on how you wanted to portray him. And the fact that Acts has, has both Simon and Paul is a result of an attempt to split the character uh, to make uh, the, the one side of, of Paul amenable to the emerging Catholic Church, and he's the one dubbed Paul, uh, whereas the heretical side of Paul that Gnostics venerated, uh, they vilified as, uh, as Simon the magician, and since he so was they usually... were appealing to both camps, which That's is what right, yeah. both Paul and Simon said they would do. Um, if I may, I would like to pull up some slides I prepared for our hmm. discussion. And uh, they relate directly to what we're speaking to right now. 
Hmm. Um, this is Irenaeus talking about Simon Magus. And he says, this man then was glorified by many as if he were a god, which also happened to Paul. And he taught that it was himself who appeared among the Jews as the son, but descended in Samaria as the father while well, he came to other nations in the character of the Holy Spirit. He represented himself in a word as being the loftiest of all powers, that is, the being who is the father over all, and he allowed himself to be called by whatsoever title men were pleased to address him. So he allowed different people to uh, interpret him as they wish so that he could gain their trust and could present himself as an authority to them. And then the next slide. Um, this is where Paul is speaking in very similar terms to say, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible to the Jews. I became like a Jew to win to the Jews to those under the law. I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Now all of this is perfectly consistent with what you just said, that they created a dichotomy in Acts so that it would appeal to both sides. Those who praised uh, the Gnosticism would find their uh, advocate in Simon Magus, and those who adhered to what became Orthodox Christianity and the Gospels could adhere to Paul. So they, they had a bait on a hook for both fish. <laughs> and yeah. um, one more slide, if I may. Please, yeah. Uh, this is from the same um, Irenaeus against heresies. Book 1, Chapter 23, Section 4 this time. Um, at present, however, I have simply been led to mention him, him being Marcion, that thou mightest know that all those who in any way corrupt the truth and injuriously affect the preaching of the church are the disciples and successors of Simon Magus of Samaria. So that firmly places uh, one of the early church fathers' view of Marcion as being a follower of Simon Magus, which is again consistent with what you just said, because he was well known to be an advocate of Paul. He created the first canon of the New Testament, which included 10 of the epistles of Paul. And therefore he reflects in the eyes of the early church, both Simon Magus and Paul, precisely as you described, which is fascinating. Yeah, it's, it is so, it, it uh, clarifies certain things like the the, the uh, quote you have there uh, i'm not under the law but i act that way if that's who i'm talking to uh but uh, i'm under christ's law which isn't the same thing etc cetera, etc cetera. why is he such a chameleon well he says uh, so he's uh, he can communicate with people uh in their terms but that you can you, you can take it uh even farther, if you factor in what Irenaeus says about how he appeared in this way, in these circumstances, and in that way, in other circumstances, that he's sort of polymorphous, which is uh, an attribute of, of ancient gods. And it really uh, clarifies a lot of things. I think Irenaeus even says that um, Simon taught you don't have to keep the Torah, because it's the creation of angels, uh, not of, of the ultimate God. And Galatians says that too, uh, in, in virtually in the same words. And uh, and so there, that's very strange uh, at, at, uh, because they quickly got off of that and said, no, 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 God gave it to Moses. But uh, the fact that he, that Paul says that, and people just sort of brush it under the rug. I, I don't think we have the right to do that. And Irenaeus says, since the, the angels gave the law, 
uh, we're not bound by it and we're saved by God's grace. Well, who, who does that sound like? Uh, and, and which again, God are we referring to? Because there is a strong ditheism being presented here. Mm -hmm. You have the creator God, Yahweh, and then you have the ultimate God, the one, which is mm -hmm. ineffable and far beyond Yahweh, which again mm -hmm. mirrors the Greek perception that there is the one which emanated the Demiurge as a creator God so that it would not uh, destroy its own unity and mm -hmm. would preserve its integrity and perfect order by not being partitioned and become particular in the womb of chaos, mm. which is the realm where the Demiurge could permeate its uh, seed of the Logoi Spermaticoi in order to impart creation and order to the chaos. But in the Old Testament accounts, this was a flubbed attempt. And therefore, uh, Yahweh created an evil material universe, and the Gnostics explain that because he was ignorant of the existence mm. of the One, and the Platonists uh, explain it as he, it was an imperfect attempt to capture the ideal forms in the first intellect of the one. So again, this is, this is all, nothing's new under the sun, and that sun is the demiurge. And we're dealing here with the ditheism, as you've been saying, that there are two gods. And these, uh, the people who authored the books on Paul, supposedly by Paul and the Gospels, were playing upon all of these contradictions so that they could appeal to the broadest possible audience, as you've indicated. I remember once, uh, some oh, a lot of years ago now, I was uh, speaking to a, a, an adult uh, study group in a Methodist church, and uh, the the uh, the guy that ran it, the pastor there, had been a student of mine uh, in uh, at Drew University, and uh, I, he asked if I would speak on the Nag Hammadi text, the Revelation of Paul, uh, not not the better known earlier known Apocalypse of Paul, which is pretty uh, orthodox and later, but rather the Nag Hammadi text of the same title. And I, and in it, like it's an attempt to supply what Paul said he could not share in Second Corinthians, that these were arata remata, unutterable utterances, uh, or the, that uh, ma things man may not utter, or that it is not lawful to utter, whatever. Well, this is an attempt to fill in that gap, and Paul uh, ascends into the uh, the heavenly spheres. And he is uh, attacked by archons from the Demiurge who tries to stop him. And he and, and uh, Paul defeats uh, the legions of the, the minions of, of the Demiurge. I, while I was talking about this, it suddenly dawned on me, this thing never mentions Jesus or Christ. <laughs> Paul is the revealer and the savior. And, and then, I, of course, I think of what it says in the beginning of 1 Corinthians. He says, I, I hear there are divisions among you, my brethren. One says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollo, Cephas, or Christ. And that has always intrigued me. Is he saying that Christ was one of several competing figureheads? And that the well, others. That all of those were first? syncretically the same figure. Well, I hadn't thought of that, but that could because be. Because Apollo is the god of the sun, and Jesus is certainly the light bringer and the god of the sun. Yeah, um, yeah interesting. But the thing was, it, it, this I thought of that in connection with the revelation of Paul, because this seems to be written by someone who would have said, I am of Paul. Paul is the redeemer. Uh, and I have some scripture on that. Uh, Paul's stigmata and his claim to be Jesus. In Galatians 2.20, hmm. it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 4.13-14 Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh, yet ye despise not nor rejected, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. 
So he is there presenting himself as Jesus Christ, or better than Jesus Christ, because he is there uh, speaking to his audience. Galatians 6, 14 and 17, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. So he's claiming to have the stigmata and the lance wound that pierced Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 3, seek, Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which ye, right. to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. So in all of these instances... He's presenting himself as the Christ, just as Simon Magus did. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I suppose you wouldn't have to interpret it that way. It usually isn't, but that seems to me an altogether natural reading of it. Uh, and and really, what's even on the traditional view? How is that much different from what uh, from what Simon was saying? Uh, well, I think the traditional then, view um, relies upon contradictory passages, which appear throughout the epistles. But you have marvelously explained away those contradictory passages as a, as a deceitful appeal to two different opposing camps so that they're playing both sides against the middle and appealing to everyone, which was Paul's stated mission, that he was to be the apostle to the Gentiles mm -hmm. of Judaism. So mm -hmm. he had to appeal to both sides. And the Gospels were obviously crafted to appeal to the sensibilities of the Greeks and the Romans. And Paul asserted that his primary mission was to bring his uh, vision of religion to the Greeks and the Romans, not so much to the Jews. Mm. Um, let's, if we may, delve into Gnosticism. Mm. And these are some of the characteristics of Paul's Gnosticism that I found and uh, some of them are very well known. The idea of ascension, which we've already touched upon, his rise to the third planet. And as you stated, um, in Gnosticism, the soul is a spark from the one that Barbello or Sophia had put into the material bodies that Yahweh had crafted. And the goal of the Gnostic is through meditation and gnosis or knowledge to free this spark of the divine spirit from the corpse of material flesh in the evil material world so that this spark of the divine can ascend back to the one which initially emanated it. And that this is the process of the unio mystica in which uh, the adept gains the knowledge which enables him to free his soul from the corpse of his body so that it can return to the one. And it has to traverse a path through the seven heavens by hopping from planet to planet, giving uh, keywords to get through the gates of these planets so that the archons will admit the soul. And the archons are evil beings which are hell-bent on preventing this ascension back to the one because they want to keep the spirit trapped in the material world. So all of this is very Gnostic and it is found within the epistles of Paul. And that's significant because all of these ideas presume that Yahweh is an evil being. The Demiurge is the evil God like Satan, mm. but they flip everything so that Jesus then becomes the serpent and the serpent is the good figure mm. because the serpent provided this gnosis, this knowledge, which enables the soul to free itself from the body and ascend back to the Meta God, the one which first emanated that divine light. And we also have the rejection of the law, which is a very Gnostic principle in that the law was given by Yahweh and is the Torah to represent the path of the Jewish people on the uh, way of the six days of creation to perfecting Yahweh's flawed creation. Creation in Judaism is not a moment, it is a process. And through the process of tikkun olam, the process of rectifying the world, they perfect Yahweh's creation. And once that is fulfilled, the Torah becomes obsolete. And the oral Torah, the Midrash, Talmud, and Kabbalah supersede. And both Yahweh and the Torah can then be discarded. 
and then the serpent becomes the premier uh, religious force which de descended from tohu from chaos which is primordial and the initial god and the superior god and that is how the cycle of creation is completed and we see in the epistles of Paul and throughout the Gospels the idea that they believe that this process was imminently about to be completed. And they said that Christ would immediately come back and the law will have been fulfilled. And when the law is fulfilled, one need not obey the law anymore and there is no more sin because sin is violation of the law. So if the law becomes obsolete, there's no longer sin. And Satan is sinless because Satan is not bound by the law because Satan is chaos. So they are saying that the firstborn, which is chaos, is the superior force, that Yahweh is a cacodemon and a malevolent force who imposes his order through the law onto humanity, and that it is the duty of humanity to free itself from this law. And by freeing itself from this law, it perfects creation and restores the divine light of the soul, which is trapped in the corpses of material flesh, so that they can then ascend back to the new earth and the new heaven, which will meet God at God's throne and they will come face to face with God. So all of this Gnostic intent by Paul is perfectly consistent with what the earlier Gnostics had said and is quite similar to what the emanation theories of the Greeks proposed. And part of that yeah, is yeah. the rejection of the flesh. Paul's advocacy for celibacy, which is sterility, the Gnostics said that it was evil to trap these spirits in material bodies, so they discouraged childbirth and engaged in abortions. Paul's immortality is, again, the restoration of the soul to the eternal one, which is timeless. Paul advocated androgyny in Galatians 3.28 when he said there is neither male nor female which is a very Gnostic conception. Mm -hmm. They believe that Adam was initially an androgyne that was separated by Yahweh into male and female aspects, which was a catastrophe. And the doceticism of Paul, where Jesus appeared only flesh-like, but not actually in the flesh, and he gives no account of Jesus's birth through Mary. Um, now, you're an expert on all of these things, and I'm very uh, interested to know your thoughts. Yeah, I think uh, Galatians, nor am I the only one, obviously, uh, I, to think this that uh, it's been interpolated, uh, uh, that it um, the basis of it was a Marcionite work, perhaps composed by Marcion himself, and that the beginning of it is a, a kind of an, a, a, an attempt to refute, again, a Marcionite attempt to refute the account of Paul's conversion and subservience to the Jerusalem pillars that you find in the book of Acts. Uh, but that beyond that, there are interpolations to uh, refute the Marcionite thinking in it, and one of them is where it says uh, that uh, in the fullness of time, uh, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born uh, under law. Now, I can understand why even from that standpoint, you would say he was born under the law. Uh, I mean, there are various ways, Catholic and Gnostic, to take that. But born of a woman... How many times have you heard someone introduce the discussion of some notable figure by saying, well, one thing we know about uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden is uh, he was born, uh, he had a mom. Well, uh, was there some thought that he might have emerged from a test tube or something? Well, what? <laughs> uh, and it, it just seems like that has to, that's nothing you would bother to say unless you're trying to refute somebody that said no. He just descended out of heaven one day, as Marcion uh, did as an adult. Do you believe that was so, a later addition, or do you believe that was part oh, yeah. and parcel of the epistle to uh, contradict the impression that people were receiving from uh, Marcion's, oh, I forget what it was called, the uh, helicon. The antithesis or the, the uh, apostolicon or the... Yes, the apostolicon. Well, I think that originally that that was not in there, and that uh, various things that have been added by uh, by uh, 
let's say, small C Catholic uh, redactors in order to co-opt the Marcionite New Testament. That was one of them to try to bring things in line with, uh, with emerging Catholicism. Uh, and, and there are others too, like I think that, like Irenaeus apparently did not know of the uh, what appears now is the first visit of Paul to Jerusalem, which is the one where he happens to mention meeting James, the brother of the Lord. Well, given what Irenaeus was trying to, to say, arguing against Marcionism, surely he would have referred to that one to which he does not refer, because uh, that one makes it uh, explicit that Paul went there to seek their okay. He wanted their rubber stamp. Th that is certainly not the Marcionite view of Paul, and, and apparently it wasn't in the copy Irenaeus had. He only has the subsequent thing where the d dispute over circumcision had come up. And so that, that's evidence that that was an interpolation as well. I think that J.C. O'Neill's probably right that all of the statements in the epistles that have Paul as a reformed persecutor are um, interpolations, uh, because as part of this, this um, attempted reconciliation of the different, uh, well, mainly of Marcionites and Catholics, they... Uh, each side was willing to embrace a slander promoted by the other for their opponent's figurehead. I think, for instance, as Luazi said, this, this idea that Peter had denied Jesus, something that in the Gospels clearly implies he's just bought himself a ticket to the inferno, uh, that uh, uh, the the Paulinists must have said that look this guy's an apostate why, why are you following him and his bishops no way uh, and by contrast um, the uh, the um, um, uh, Catholic Christians uh, what am I saying here I'm getting all mixed up uh, the, uh, those uh, who attack Paul of the interjections that Paul had said that Peter was rejecting Christ. Yeah, and uh, from the other side, from the, the Ebionites and such, uh, who were in view also, and obviously in the epistles, uh, they promoted the idea that you, you guys are following uh, in the train of a persecutor of Christians. Well, what the heck? Uh, he, he can't be real. Whereas, in fact, the original charge was that Paul, as in my opinion, Paul as a Christian apostle saying you don't need the Torah anymore, that this made Jewish Christians say, this guy is trying to, he's persecuting those who, uh, by simply opposing. Even Paul speaks of using rhetorical weapons in the left hand and the right. Well, they were saying he's arguing against, he's persecuting uh, the true Christianity. Well, this gets garbled into the slander that Paul was hunting down any kind of Christians to torture and kill them. And so you have two slanders that eventually um, were, were incorporated as, well, okay, they were sinners like anybody else, but if you'll accept Paul on that basis will accept Peter on it. Uh, so th I think there's a, there's a bunch of things going on in Acts, especially and in the the redaction of the Marcionite uh, Pauline material. They they tried to just ignore it and come up with I, I think the pastoral epistles, for instance, First and Second Timothy and Titus were intended originally as a Catholic counter Pauline canon. Uh, where Paul sounds like a good Catholic. And those were uh, absent and, uh, from Marcion's uh, epistles. That's there. right, because they were written subsequently against him. Oh, here's the real Pauline letters. But once they realized, look, we're, we're making no ground here. We're making no headway. Uh, maybe we ought to try to co-opt the Marcionites by accepting their their uh, material, their gospel, their epistles, a lot of good stuff in them we wouldn't object to, but what there is, we can finesse, we can interpolate things, we can reinterpret them uh, and modify them, and there are plenty of contextual reasons to say that that's what's happened. And There's a lot of weird... with the Gospels in terms of the Evangelicon and the Gospel uh -huh. of Marcion became the Gospel of Luke. Is that not true? 
Here's my favorite example, though it may be an insignificant one. Uh, the Marcion, Marcion's gospel had in common with um, uh, Mark and Matthew, uh, where Jesus uses this parable, this analogy of uh, not putting uh, new wine into old wine skins. And, uh, but in Luke, which was, of course, based directly on Marcion's uh, gospel, it gives that parable, but then it adds peculiarly, but no one after drinking old wine is interested in the new, for he says the old is better. Well, uh, come on, wh why is that in this anti in my gospel and not in the others. So I, I can't really get rid of that, but I can negate it, which scribes tended to do apparently. So yeah, and there, there are plenty of other ones. That's, that's just a tiny one, but I especially revealing, I think. To digress, uh, that's something of particular interest to me because there are many um, Judaic legends about the idea that the tree of knowledge was actually a grapevine. Mm. And that Jesus represents that grapevine in the form of the serpent, which ascends the fig tree, which is also the mm. tree of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jesus treads the wine press, and the Eucharist is his blood, which is, of course, the fruit of the vine, the grape juice fermented into wine. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the uh, Kabbalah, especially in the Zohar, presents this as a history of the fact that initially the grapes are not ripe. And Jesus is the unripe fruit of the vine of the tree of knowledge. The knowledge is not yet ripe to consume, so it is poisonous. And that the Eucharist is consuming that poisonous, unripe wine, old wine, in the cup of God's wrath, so that it serves as a poison to the enemies of the Israelites and that Jesus is covertly an advocate of the Israelites who in end times will return to smite the Christians and the apostate Jews. Just as Satan on Yom Kippur accepts the scapegoat and then becomes the advocate instead of the accuser in the heavenly court. Wow. And in Kabbalah, Jesus is Samael, the male aspect of Satan. Mm. So that Jesus uh, is both the Son and the Father, as it states throughout uh, Christianity, and that Satan is sacrificing his own son to himself as the scapegoats for all the sins of the nation of Israel, so that, as the high priest Caiaphas said, he could save the nation. And what, wow. what it really is, is a process of chaos assimilating the light of the demiurge to the point where the darkness shines. And at the point in which the darkness shines and all of the opposites in their polarized pairs have fulfilled creation and perfected creation through the uh, permutation and permeation of the light throughout chaos, that is the eighth candle of the menorah, when... Uh, all of creation is completed, the world has been rectified, and then the eighth candle shines and the darkness shines. And at that point, the Jews can then acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, son of David, and is their Messiah. They can welcome him back into the fold as the reincarnation of Esau, who was the brother of Jacob. And then creation will be perfected and Christ will become their advocate against the Christians. Wow. And we find strong elements of this in the Gospel of Judas, where um, Christ tells Judas that the disciples are deliberately deceiving, well, are themselves deceiving and are misleading the Christians and setting them up for their ultimate demise. Because the purpose is to perfect chaos with the unripe wine which poisons those who consume Christ's Eucharist until it can be put into new wineskins when the fruit of the tree of knowledge is ripe. And then it will be kosher for the Jews to consume this new wine in the new skins of the new earth and the new heavens, which are referred to in Isaiah. And um, all of this was to take place after the commencement of the third age 
each of the days of creation, as it says in uh, Proverbs, is a thousand years. So it becomes a 6,000 year cycle broken into 2,000 year cycles, which represent the ages of the zodiac from Taurus, Aries to Pisces. And Pisces is the two fish of the two Leviathans in Isaiah 27. And um, those two fish are actually one fish. The, the Messiah, son of Joseph, Jesus is the son of Joseph and the Messiah, son of Joseph, bears the soul of the divided Messiahs. He is, um, I'm sorry, he is Yehida Mashiach. And Yehida is the highest soul. It is the soul of chaos, the soul of Tohu. And the world of Tohu is above all of the other worlds. And the purpose is for the Messiah, son of Joseph, to die so that his soul, Yehida Mashiach, is freed and can enter the body of the Messiah, son of David, who is the true king and is the straight serpent. And Jesus is the crooked serpent coiled about the tree of knowledge. So Jesus must die and then give up his soul, which is the story of the passion narrative. When he gives up his soul, he has defeated the Gentiles by uh, enticing them to drink the poison of his blood, the wine which intoxicates, wine intoxicates, which brings the mind into a state of chaos, which is what Jesus is, he is chaos. And then the Gentiles are defeated by the Messiah, son of Joseph, who is also referred to as the Messiah anointed for war. He is the Messiah of Isaiah 63, verses 1 to 6, who treads the wine press and frees up this intoxicating, poisonous wine. And then when this is accomplished, he gives up his soul, and that soul enters the body of Messiah, son of David. Messiah, son of David, is the body. He is Jacob. He is the reincarnation of Jacob and King David. Jesus is the reincarnation of Cain and Esau, and this is explicitly stated in Chaim Vital's uh, Gate of Reincarnations. So the soul has to leave Jesus and enter David, and that is the story of Jesus Christ and Jesus Barabbas in uh, Matthew 27, where Jesus is the substitute fool king who dies so that the actual king, King David, Jesus Barabbas, can ascend to the throne and become king of the Jews. The, uh, the idea that the tree of knowledge is a grapevine with unripe fruit that is poisonous until it becomes ripe is shown throughout the Old Testament, and it's often paired with the fig tree. And Jesus is the uh, serpent, and the uh, fig tree, Jesus is the serpent, which is the grapevine, and the cross is the tree of knowledge, which is the fig tree. And for example, in Zechariah chapter three, you have the high priest Joshua, which is Jesus's name, being tried by Satan. And Satan fails and actually becomes the advocate. And at the very end, everyone is entitled to sit under the grapevine and the fig tree which that means that the fruit has then become ripe and is safe to consume and is kosher. And that is the full story that the Kabbalah reveals about Zechariah chapter 3, is that this is an allegorical tale of what happens with Jesus. He is put on trial just as the Jews are put on trial on the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, they offer up the scapegoat to Satan. Satan is Azazel, which was stated in First Enoch before Christianity appeared. And when uh, Satan is given this gift of the scapegoat, he becomes confused and flips from being the accuser and prosecutor and punisher of the Jews to becoming their advocate. And that is the purpose of Christ, that in his second coming, he becomes the advocate of the Jews and smites the Christians and the apostate. Jews. What well, utterly fascinating. Where can I read this systematized? Uh, you've just done a great job of it, but I'd like to be able to, you know, sit down and read uh, it and absorb it. If I may, I'll get to that in a moment. May I first okay. present a couple of slides that I had prepared? Please, yeah. 
Um, Jesus represents the Orphic God, Phanes Protogenes, which is Greek for light bringer first begotten. And in John, Jesus is referred to both as the light bringer and as the first begotten. In John chapter one, verses one through three, in the beginning was the word in Greek logos and the word logos was with God, Theon, and the word logos was God, Theos. He was with God, Theon, in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been. So Jesus is presented as the creator God that is emanated from God. That is the exact story of Phanes Protogenes, who is emanated in the cosmic egg from the god Kronos to create the universe which, with his divine light, which emanates into the serpent coiled about him, which represents chaos or the womb. So the light is the seminal fluid of the uh, Logoi Spermatikoi, which impregnates the, the uh, primordial substance, the matter, as the Neoplatonists called it, which is inherent in the darkness of the womb, brings to it light, and then those two opposites commingle, and the commingling of those two opposites perfects creation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Yet for us there is but one God, Theos, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Kyrios, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. So Jesus is again presented as an emanation and creator God, emanating from the one, exactly as Phanes Protogenes emanated from Kronos, his father, and Ananka, his mother. And um, Phanes is an androgynous god. And we can see that this androgynous son represents both the male and the female characteristics, which is the commingling of the light and the darkness of chaos in the womb of chaos. So again, it is the pairing of opposites like yin and yang into one being, and that is the representation of the sun in many ancient mythologies and the basis of the idea of the Trinity where you have the male father, the female mother, and the androgynous son who combines the characteristics of both to produce creation. And Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the creator and the destroyer, just as Phanes Protogenes is. And the Orphic myth of Phanes Protogenes is what inspired Plato to create his concept of the one who emanates the Demiurge as the creator god. And then uh, the female aspect of the Demiurge becomes the world soul. And we see that also in Kabbalah. Adam Kadmon is an androgynous being. He is the light which is emanated exactly as Christ and exactly as Phanes from the higher god, the Ein, the Ein Sof, and the Or Ein Sof, into the uh, Tsimsum, the contraction of chaos. He then produces the light, which emanates the Ten Sephirot and uh, the world of manifestation in which we live. So it is a retelling of the exact same story of Phanes Protogenes in both Jesus Christ and Adam Kadmon. Um, in terms of... I just want to present this visual image because I think it's very striking. Mm -hmm. As I was saying, the Gnostics believe that Jesus is the serpent on the tree of knowledge. And Jesus hanging on the cross is the serpent in the tree of knowledge. And here I juxtapose these two images. And you frequently see in Christian iconography, I guess it's Mary and uh, I forget who else it would be, but you see them paired on either side of Christ exactly the same way as Adam and Eve would be paired on either side of the tree of knowledge. And you see Jesus offering the knowledge in the same way that the serpent offered knowledge to Adam and Eve. And in um, John chapter 8, verses 44 and 45, he says that Yahweh was a liar from the beginning and God was a liar. Uh, Yahweh lied to Adam and Eve and said that if they ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they would immediately die, and they did not. And for tempting Adam and Eve to consume this fruit of knowledge, the serpent was cursed. 
And we know that um, Paul said in Galatians 3.13 that Jesus was cursed and that he redeemed us by becoming a curse for the law. Now that contradicts what Paul states in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, where he says that anyone who says that Jesus is cursed is not speaking by the Holy Spirit. So he's admitting that he is not speaking by the Holy Spirit, but is instead speaking uh, as the one, as the higher God, the Meta God, which is above Yahweh. And in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, it says, anyone hanged on a tree is cursed. And both Jesus and the serpent were cursed. And the serpent is cursed in Genesis chapter 3, 14, verse, uh, verses 14 and 15, for offering this knowledge to Adam and Eve, which would make them become godly and approach immortality. And all of this relates to the stories of... Um, the Tower of Babel, as well as the Garden of Eden, and the idea that Yahweh fears that mankind will become immortal, ascend to the gods, and slay the gods, which, as you know, comes from the Prometheus myth, and the myth of the Atlanteans, that uh, the gods feared that humanity would become godlike and then punish them. And the punishment that they gave in the Greek myths is that uh, man would be smited by being wed to females and would have to give birth to new generations and would have to labor and toil for his food. Whereas in the Garden of Hesperides and in the Golden Age, nature provided everything that mankind needed in order to survive. So this is an obvious syncretism. And the idea is that Cain was also cursed to build cities and Tubal Cain was cursed to utilize metallurgy to create armor and weaponry and defenses against weaponry. And so this knowledge is progressively the idea that we stray from nature and become increasingly industrialized into what Hesiod called the Iron Age. And in the Iron Age, uh, every man turns against every other man. Every man is forced to constantly struggle merely to survive because the abundance of nature has been destroyed and we are forced to produce our own food. And Jesus called for all of these things to happen in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21 and I think Mark 13, where he talks about the idea that an uh, age is coming in which uh, brothers will turn against brothers and fathers against sons and sons against fathers. All of this is a complete copy of the mythology of Hesiod of the Iron Age. Mm. And Christ welcomes this idea that we have to have this Iron Age in which uh, everything becomes chaotic. Because when chaos finally triumphs over good is when the fruit of the tree of knowledge finally becomes ripe. The law has been fulfilled. The light has commingled with the darkness. And it is therefore time for a new golden age to emerge because the end of the old cycle becomes the beginning of a new cycle. So they see it as a good thing that the world becomes increasingly corrupt and ultimately is destroyed. And in Revelation, in Matthew 24, Luke 21, etc., it talks about the beauty of this idea that Christ will come back and destroy the world. And in the Apocalypse of Abraham, it makes very clear that the goal of this is to exterminate the Gentiles so that the Israelites can emerge and gain a world which has been um, cleansed of what they, the Kabbalists refer to as the Sitra Akhra which is the other side to the Sitra Yamina, which is the Israelites who are the right-hand side. So the left has to give way to the right, and that will be the fulfillment of creation. When creation is fulfilled, this evil god Yahweh, who the Israelites always hated, if you go throughout the Old Testament, you can find that they consistently rejected Yahweh and always sought out malevolent, uh, benevolent gods as opposed to the cackle demon Yahweh, such as Asherah, who becomes the queen of heaven, and in Kabbalah, Shekinah, the female aspect of God. Female is chaos. Chaos is the womb. It is the female, the world soul, the source of all souls. So the female has to triumph over the male, and the male has to be rejected, and his uh, stupidity, 
stupidly ordered universe has to be destroyed so that uh, creation is rectified. And that is why Christianity, in my view, was created to serve as this process of enticing the Gentiles to serve their satanic role of being the punishers, prosecutors, and accusers of the Jews until wow. such point as the world has become so chaotic that it destroys itself with the knowledge that Satan has given it, the unripe knowledge, which becomes science and technology, just mm -hmm. as in the Greek legends that uh, Prometheus gave them the ability to create civilization, agriculture, mathematics, etc. Mm -hmm. All of this is destructive because it is not yet ripe. But at the point at which it becomes ripe, it becomes the cure. The poison becomes the cure. And then uh, science and technology can be utilized to kill Yahweh and to take the seat of his throne, which is what is symbolized by ascending to Yahweh's throne. It is climbing the Tower of Babel to ascend to God and destroy Yahweh so that Shekinah and the Israelites can rule the universe and become masters of chaos through perfected knowledge, which is the ripe fruit of the tree of knowledge. And they will then be able to restore humanity to its initial state of Adam as an androgyne. And they are presently working on post-gender, post-humanist technologies, mm. which enable them to breed human beings in artificial wombs as androgynous, immortal beings, which is what Adam was initially before the fall. So they view it as a complete cycle of knowledge, which is poisonous until the fruit becomes ripe, then ripening and becoming the cure. Now, in terms of where you can find my work on this. Ah, good. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry I'm going on. It's, it, no, it's no, something no. I've been working on for years. Um, These are the books that I've written on this subject. You can find them at cjbbooks.com. I'll be happy to send you uh, PDF files of all of them. And oh. in these books, I merge what the Kabbalists have said to explain why Christianity was formulated and the role that it fulfills in tikkun olam of rectifying creation. And I also demonstrate how all of these... Um, Religious beliefs draw from the Orphic myth of Phanes Protogenes and from the Platonic and Middle Platonic in the age of Philo Eudeus on through to the Neoplatonism and the exchange of the Neoplatonists with the Christians, uh, as recorded by Hippolytus and other of the church fathers. They destroyed all of the Neoplatonist books. The Neoplatonists rejected the Christians because the Christians called the Demiurge evil. But what the Christians actually had done was created a ditheism of the creator God, the serpent, as a Demiurge, and Yahweh as a Demiurge. And they, they actually had two Demiurges. But since they utilized the term Demiurge for Yahweh, who in the Apocryphon of John is also called Samael, which is the male aspect of Satan, they could not apply that term to Jesus Christ, so they instead referred to him as the Alpha and the Omega and the Adam of Light. Hmm. In the uh, Gnostic or pre-Gnostic book, Eugnostus the Blessed, um, this mediator, uh, as um, Philo Eudeus called him and as he's referred to in the uh, New Testament as Jesus, is uh, becomes... Adam Kadmon becomes um, Metatron, all of these beings, which are actually Phanes Protogenes, who is the mediator, emanated from the one to bring about creation and to spread light into the chaos. Well, fascinating. Is there a, a movement or school of thought, or are you the lone pioneer so far? I'm a pioneer, but I've drawn on many geniuses like you who have inspired me to this. I think the Kabbalists, uh, the high-ranking Kabbalists, especially those of the Chabad Lubavitch movement, oh. who study the Tanya of Schnorr Salman, who study um, 
the, the ideas of the Ari of Isaac Luria as uh, they came down through Chaim Vital in his books, uh, The Tree of Life and um, The Gate of Reincarnations, and in the Zohar. All of these things that I'm talking about are stated, but excuse me, they're stated in coded language. And I think uh, I've properly interpreted these codes. And um, I think it's pretty clear that what I'm saying is correct, as you'll see when you read my books. But there are also, now that we're reaching this age, when the fruit of the tree of knowledge is becoming ripe, and Jesus is flipping from becoming the, from being the uh, prosecutor, accuser, and punisher of the Jews to becoming their advocate at the changing of the age from Pisces, the two Leviathans, to the age of Aquarius. All of these ages began with Gemini, and Gemini is the twins. The twins are Esau and Jacob. You'll notice that Aquarius is one man, and that man is Jacob, and he is pouring out the waters of chaos. Um, if, again, I can get into a pretty deep explanation here, but throughout the Old Testament, there was always a resentment of the firstborn because Gentiles existed before Jews. Jews are the product of the cacodemon Yahweh. Yahweh is the light. The light entered the primordial darkness of chaos. Primordial darkness of chaos is the firstborn son. So there is a chaos comp between the firstborn sons and the secondborn sons, which is referred to in the war scroll of the Qumran documents as the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. The light is the secondborn, it is Jacob, it is the Israelites. The firstborn is the Gentiles who are Cain and have that wonderful knowledge. Uh, another thing about the tree of knowledge as the grapevine, the Zohar specifies that Noah was actually another satanic figure like Jesus Christ and like Cain. And Noah planted the tree of knowledge and brought evil back into the world when he created the vineyard. Mm. So Noah was actually another evil figure, even after the evil God Yahweh had destroyed the whole earth with the flood and cleansed it so that there could be a new garden. Satan had initially planted the tree of knowledge and then Noah replanted it. And right away, he became drunk on his own wine, which means he was intoxicated with the irrationality and disorder of chaos. So he brought the blood of the firstborn Gentiles of Cain back into the world. And that has to be absorbed by the Jews because they actually view it as being the superior bloodline and they are deprived of this great sense of being the firstborn because in Judaism and many ancient religions, the firstborn inherit a double portion. And in terms of Judaism, that double portion represents the present world, Olam Hazeh, and the future world of the world to come, which is Olam Haba. Since chaos is the firstborn, chaos has the double portion. It begins the cycle of creation, which begins in primordial chaos. And then after the light is uh, ejaculated into the universe, chaos ultimately triumphs over it, very much like entropy. So it also inherits the world to come. So the firstborn becomes the, obtains the double inheritance, and the Israelites resent the fact that that is given to the Gentiles, so they want to inherit it which is why they have to take over the soul of Yehida, which is the soul of chaos, and absorb the soul Yehida from the Gentiles and from Jesus Christ into their Messiah, Messiah, son of David, who will then become complete. And they will also destroy Yahweh so that he cannot instigate a new cycle of creation. They do not want the Demiurge to reappear at the end of the age of Pisces and create a new golden age. Instead, they want to create a silver age, which is the age of moonlight. The moonlight to them represents the absorption of chaos of the light of daylight, since the moon reflects 
the light of the sun, it represents the commingling of the opposites of darkness and daylight. And they view that also as the commingling of the body of David with the soul of Jesus Christ, which is why Jesus Christ gave up his soul, his spirit, and insisted that it had to happen. And that when it happened, it would be the fulfillment of the age and the absorption of the light by chaos so that chaos becomes stronger. And at that point, they can then get rid of Yahweh and his corrupted sense of order, which inhibits freedom, which is why Jesus always railed against the irrationality of the laws of the Sabbath. And he broke all of the Sabbath laws and said that they were irrational, that it is better to save and heal people and feed people on the Sabbath than to allow them to suffer. That is a statement that the law is evil and that is why the law produced a wicked creation and that the perfection of creation is the destruction of the law and the destruction of Yahweh. Hmm. Boy, it's so fascinating. Um, there was somewhere else I was headed, but I think I lost course. Well, that's easy to do given the great complexity of it. Um, in terms of Paul, who do you think, when do you think the epistles first appeared? Uh, well, with, uh, I, I sort of think they're all late first, early second century works, uh, which only sounds odd. Be, I mean, um, the, uh, of course, there's the, the, related ambiguities of who was Paul and what reason is there on which to base a guess as to when he would have lived. Uh, even if he's Simon Magus, there's ambiguity in the patristic sources and the New Testament, whether he was a first or early second century character. But with the, the martyrdom of Paul, about which we read in uh, the Acts of Paul, a fanciful work, if there ever was one, um, they, it's, uh, it, it's so legend-laden, and it's really the only, quote, information we have about the life and, and death of Paul that I, I don't know that, uh, like, the, the authorship and the date are... Uh, uh, related issues, but the one doesn't settle the other. And so I tend to think that though um, Simon, the historical Paul, also mentioned by Josephus, if he wrote any of the original material, and there might be a passage in Romans that, that fits that description, uh, it uh, or if they're largely written by Paulinists, who, who uh, would have been Simonians, I guess, uh, and then Marcionites, which I view as kind of a second generation um, Simonianism, then uh, you, you've got uh, really a kind of patchwork quilt of, of work by Paulinists who already had evolved various disagreements, which is why, for instance, in First Corinthians, just turn the page and you'll find the refutation of the page before uh, their long <laughs> arguments on two different sides of the same question but they're all attributed to paul implying that what you have debates within a paulinist movement so i i don't know who wrote them exactly or when but they don't seem to have been around really before marcion um he must have been the first collector if he Is wasn't the first was the writer. Yeah. yeah, he he could well have been. The only Why reason I hesitate at that is that you still have um, internal evidence that you've got different writers with different opinions. Uh, but other than that, I would think, yeah, he wrote the, the ones uh, short of the pastoral epistles. Uh, I just read um, a book... Um, uh, what was it, uh, Marcion, Marcus Vincent's Marcion and the Dates of the Synoptic Gospels, something almost that's either exact or close to it, 
where he makes a really, to me, convincing case that Marcion originated the gospel genre and that his was the first, and that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all utilized his pirated it, though that's that's a kind of a nasty word. I don't they didn't have copyright in those days, but they all used it as the basis to come up with um, their own versions that were were uh, either anti or non-Marcionite. Well, if that's the case and it makes more and more sense to me, then you got to wonder if Marcion also was responsible. Well, maybe it's exactly like it, that he started the ball rolling with his versions of the Pauline epistles and others began to expand them and imitate them. And so we'd still have to look at those with the uh, with the microscope, trying to figure out what's been added and what was the Marcionite original. So ironically, uh, he is... Uh the author of Orthodox Christianity as well as the heresy? Well, in a sense, yeah, because like uh, Marcus Vincent points out that in, like you can find what looks like Jesus quotes, though they don't match exactly any gospel um, in Justin Martyr and various others, but you don't have any Jesus stories ever referred to by these early authors. Now, why the heck not if they were floating around? I mean, we make plenty of use of them now. And uh, so it he has said to be that they were incorporating the so-called prophecies of the Septuagint, which was actually a plan for this Messiah, son of Joseph, to appear so that they could apply this Christ figure as the Messiah, son of Joseph, who was fulfilling the law for them. Well, I, I do think that even removed from all of this, you have people like Thomas L. Brody and uh, Randall Helms and others who say, boy, it looks like the gospel stories, virtually every one of them was uh, a rewrite of this or that specific Old Testament story. And uh, so I wrote to Marcus Vincent and said, what about these guys in their theories? Do you think Marcion was the one that, that rewrote the Septuagint into the Gospels? And he said, yeah, uh, that, that would make sense. Like, well, why would, he, why would Marcion do it if he was opposed to Judaism? Well, because he saw himself putting uh, old wine into new skins. Uh, that that it, the other way, you know, he wouldn't have done that. He wouldn't have retained the forms of Judaism for whatever he perceived as the new revelation. But that's not saying he didn't see things he liked in the Old Testament, but didn't like the Jewish framework. So he rewrote them in a Jesus amenable manner. So I think he did. And then once they saw it, Matthew, and he Mark was co-opting Gnosticism at the same time. As you mm -hmm. said, he was gaining both camps. Yeah. So I, I, I'm having to rethink all of this stuff yet again. But I, I do think Marcion was the first to have the Pauline letters. And, um, it's and you possible believe that the gospel of Marcion was the, uh, the old uh, belief they had in the Cavella, the source document for the Synoptic Gospels. Mm. And uh, one thing Vincent points out is that we can kind of reconstruct what was in the Marcionite gospel because Tertullian and, and Irenaeus and Justin all say, well, here's one place where Marcion lacks so-and-so or whatever. We can get a pretty good idea of what it must have read like. And if you compare that with the present synoptics or even John, you find that when they overlap with Marcion, uh, they agree with the wording and the order, but where they don't have Marcion and, and they've gotten material they made up or from other sources, they're all over the place. They, they don't agree with each other, much That's less Marcion. That's a real tell. That's a strong tell. Yeah, uh, that uh, he convinced me. Um, uh, something else I'd like to bounce off of you. Both Justin Martyr and Simon Magus were Sumerians. Hmm. And that fits in with uh, the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, where she confronts Jesus with the Samaritan belief that a Messiah was coming. And the Samaritans refer to that Messiah as Taheb, 
Mm -hmm. And I think that is where um, the Septuagint drew the idea, which is presented in Zechariah and especially in Isaiah, that there would be a suffering Messiah and a triumphant Messiah. Mm. That suffering Messiah is related to the Messiah son of Joseph. Joseph's two sons were Ephraim and Manasseh. The Samaritans are supposedly the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh. Mm. And they are also supposedly miscegenated with Gentiles, which happened in the captivity. So this figure of Jesus appearing as Messiah, son of Joseph, appears to be perfectly consistent with the idea that he was the Samaritan Messiah, which would also be perfectly consistent with the idea that the Samaritan Simon Magus is actually the figure who is being described both as Paul and as Jesus Christ. Here's another odd thing to put in that puzzle. It occurred to me sometime back that when Jesus says to her, if you knew or recognized the gift of God, you'd be asking him for water. Well, that happens to be just what Dosithius means, the gift of God. Uh, and Dosithius was like a rival uh, of Simon Magus and a Samaritan Messiah in his own right, who founded his own sect after he split with uh, uh, Simon after the death of John the Baptist. Well, and and the uh, the idea, but if it was Simon, he's supposed to be there. That makes sense too, because the woman at the well would be Helen, uh, who had these previous husbands, and now is shacking up with somebody she's not even married to. Boy, does that sound Simonian? That uh, she had originally been Helen of Troy and was married many times, and then was a a prostitute before Simon rescued her. Um, well, Shara, the queen of heaven, was a prostitute. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Lilith, mm. uh, the female aspect of God, is a prostitute. So all of these goddesses are prostitutes. And the conception of the idea that the, um, the androgyne is separated into its male and female aspects produces prostitution. Plato wrote a famous piece in the symposium where he described all human beings as initially being androgynes with uh, mm -hmm. four hands and four feet, and they could tumble and that threatened the gods. So the gods cut them in half so they could only run and not tumble as fast and couldn't catch the gods. So this androgynous aspect permeates through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of the well, it's also significant that water represents chaos the primordial waters of chaos of Genesis in the very first paragraph talks about the dove, Asherah, hovering over the waters of chaos. That again relates to Phanes Protogenes because his female aspect is the bird Nyx, which hovers over the waters of chaos. And the Egyptians have a similar uh, belief. So in terms of baptism, in terms of the great flood, and in terms of consuming the water from the well of Jesus and the idea that the Holy Spirit descends when you are baptized in the water, mm. all relates mm. to the idea that Jesus is restoring chaos and that in the age of Aquarius, uh, the man dumping the pot of water, which is referred to in Luke, mm. is uh, the restoration of chaos and the waters of chaos. Wow. Well, it gave me a lot to think about. Wow. Fascinating. Well, it has uh, been a wonderful pleasure speaking with you. I am and so grateful to you for being so generous with your time and enduring my rants. No, no, no. Fascinating, really. Uh, you've done me a favor. And I hope uh, that we can speak again. I will mm -hmm. send you uh, via email PDFs of my book. Thank you so much. I Great. Extremely grateful again to you for coming on. And um, I do appreciate your time very much and your insights. You've given me a lot to think about, and uh, I'm going to be investigating all the things that I learned from you today. And vice versa. Uh, thank you. Okay. I think that would be a good point. Um, again, I thank you, sir. I thank you, Dr. Uh -huh. Price. It was wonderful to meet you. 
I hope that everyone goes and buys your books on Amazon or whatever outlet is convenient for them. Do you have a website you can refer them to? Yeah, it's uh, Robert M. Price, uh, separated by dots. No, wait, no. No, I think it's just uh, all one word, Robert M. Price dot mindvendor dot com. And that's V-E-N-D-O-R, of course. And are you still doing podcasts? Yes, I I uh, do uh, my own uh, Bible geek um, every week or so. Uh, and I'm lately I'm on all sorts of other people's podcasts uh, two or three times a week. Uh, it's and, amazing uh, how much time you give up to help inform people of these facts, which almost no one else has the knowledge or ability and willingness to uh, to bring forth to the public. I'm well, those of us to... who do, uh, I think we're like, uh, what did uh, Uncle Ben say to Spider-Man? With great power comes great responsibility. Same thing with great knowledge. Uh, it's useless if you don't share it. Uh, I often get asked, if we give up on Christianity, what can we supplant it with so that society functions in a moral, organized, uh, family-based community type of structure. Um, Nietzsche had a very negative view of Christianity and wanted to supplant it with the worship of Dionysus, but he, um, he had this Superman conception of uh, immorality as not necessarily being so bad and that the strong should triumph over the weak, and that was one of the reasons he resented Christianity. Is there an alternative that you propose to Christianity if we succeed in informing people that Christianity is a mythology as demonstrated by the fact that it is derivative of all these other mythologies and couldn't possibly be a divine revelation? Well, my position is sort of Gnostic, at least formally. I don't think there's any way the kind of thing we know is ever really going to filter down to most people and that they're like the sukikoi of Gnosticism, uh, not to be condescending, but let's not kid ourselves. But luckily, with Christianity and Judaism and so forth, uh, that provides a, a, a rationale and a, like what Peter Berger calls a sacred canopy of values uh, that uh, works reasonably well, uh, given human nature, I guess, as well as it could be expected, to uh, give people a reason to be moral and to have a sane society. Uh, and uh, even if we're simply atheists, that is a kind of gnosis. And uh, I figure when it comes to most people, don't rock the boat. They'd never believe it. They'd never understand it. You could dig up the bones of Jesus. They'd laugh it off and keep going to church. And, and it's not bad if they do. They, they're getting uh, decent values. So I, I figure I have a, we have a, like a Diogenes-like responsibility to be on the lookout for people that realize something doesn't compute here. So what is really the truth? I'm glad you asked. And, Speaking and of Diogenes, aren't there many it. parallel verses between uh, the cynics and uh, Christianity? Uh, yeah, but a lot of the stuff that Christians don't accept anyway, like po voluntary poverty, nah, uh, and uh, a lot of other stuff. Uh, but the at least, but I think the the Gnostic approach, like they learned fast not to go blabbing their their apparently blasphemous views, because what are you gaining there? You're just egging people on to persecute you and making murderers out of them. Keep your mouth shut until you find somebody like the rich young ruler. What do I do to inherit eternal life? Well, uh, what about the Ten Commandments? You know them, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got that all taken care of. And then Jesus looked upon him and loved him and said, if you would be perfect, there are things you can do. Uh, I view that as the, the, the Gnostic uh, lot to uh, wait and see if there's somebody who is ready for more and because they'll suffer for not having it and it'll be enlightening to get it. But for everybody else, you might as well not rock the boat because they're never gonna catch on to this. I see. 
And the, the uh, Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels explains that he speaks in parables. Yeah. To keep, uh, people from becoming aware of what it's really all about. Because what would they do with it if they found out? They said, what? What are you talking about? Heresy. And that does nobody any good. How do you sound the alarm in that climate of the danger of the apocalyptic cult aspect of Christianity and the way that it is exploited for political agendas to bring about wars? And we are presently um, being threatened with atomic war which some view as a good thing and see uh, those involved in that as agents of God. Yeah, I think they're a very small minority. I mean, I, I had, I was involved in a fundamentalist Baptist church for years and they were all uh, convinced the rapture was coming by the mid 1970s and all that, but they were uh, just regular middle-class people that figured uh, when it does happen, we'll be raptured out of the way anyhow, and uh, at least, uh, you know, it'll be the second coming to Christ. They're not drooling over the deaths of loads of people. They'd rather not that not happen, but they figure, well, if that is going to happen, but the second coming is going to follow it, I'll, I'll buckle down and wait. I know there are some nuts out there that say, oh boy, let's push the button now, uh, hotheads. But I doubt seriously there, there are apo many apocalyptic believers who are like ancient zealots. I, I could be wrong, but I, I think those are probably just fanatics. Speaking anecdotally, uh, I've always been good friends with Bible-thumping Christians in the Midwest all my life. And they always told me that in the event that those things start to unfold, they will become very passive and simply sit down and settle down and start praying yeah. so that they are raptured and that they are certainly not going to try to provoke it, but mm. they, uh, they're they also not going to try to fight it. There's, they're going to become uh, more passive and prayerful. Hmm. Once again, let me thank you and bring this to a conclusion. I don't want to take advantage of your generosity. So again, it was wonderful to speak with you and uh, I'll be sending you those books and uh, Thank bye bye you so for now. Much. Sure. Appreciate it, Chris. Take care. And you too. Bye. Well, that was really great. I am very grateful to Dr. Price. If you're interested in the subjects that we discussed, you can uh, buy his books and also please have a look at my books, which you can find at cjbbooks.com. Um, I go into much, much greater depth and detail and provide a lot of primary source material to substantiate what I've been saying today with Dr. Price in my books, which you can find here. And Thank you very much for watching. If you can, there will be a donation link in the description for this video. Please donate. Uh, I would like to generate some funds so that I can do a better job with these presentations. Um, I need a better camera, a better computer, several things. And again, thank you very much for watching.